Hey y'all, Michelle Raza here with the Finding Yourself Book Club. And today we're gonna to be talking about John Gottman's What Makes Love Last. We've been talking through working through your messes big and small. Um, in our last video on Gottman, we talked about, sorry, you gotta flip back on the pages. Um, moving from just being heard and understood to persuasion and problem solving. If you haven't had a chance, please do check out our website. We're at www.findingyourselfsatx.com. There you can fill out a contact form and we'll reach out to you. Um, you can also fill out the life balance questionnaire and send it to us. Your first consult is always free. Okay, so now today we're gonna move into the Gottman's Aftermath Kit, healing previous injuries and hurt feelings. Once you become familiar with holding State of the Union meetings, I recommend using the process to revisit regrettable incidents from the past that still haunt your relationship. Unless they are confronted and understood, unhappy memories push couples closer to negative sentiment override. I've developed an attunement-based approach to help couples shut the door on these lingering conflicts. The aftermath kit is very similar to the blueprint. Its goal is to increase understanding and empathy, but it is more extensive. The same rules apply. You agree not to argue the facts of the situation. Perception is everything. Both points of view are valid. Don't use this recovery kit until you have some emotional distance from the incident and can discuss it without getting back into it. Approach your discussion as if you are in a theater's balcony, observing the actors on stage, except the two of you are the actors. If either of you floods, stop the discussion. After you offer each other appreciations, follow these six steps, taking turns as speaker and listener. If you need extra help, you'll find suggestions for words and phrases you can use during these steps in Appendix 2. Step 1. Recall and name the emotions out loud. When you're the speaker, describe all the feelings you experienced during the incident. Do not get into the why you reacted a particular way yet, and do not comment on your partner's feelings. Step 2. Discuss your subjective reality. Acknowledge that your experience did not match your partner's. Don't debate the facts. Take turns talking about how you each perceived the situation. What did you require from your partner to avoid a regrettable incident? When you're the speaker, remember to describe these needs as positive wishes. I needed you to acknowledge all of them even if they seem silly or contradictory in retrospect. If you didn't admit to these wishes at the time, mention that as well. The most common needs people express are wanting to feel listened to, understood, complimented, desired, and comforted. Letting your partner know what was going on inside makes your behavior more understandable. The more specific you make your descriptions, the better. I wanted you to stop texting when I was talking. I needed you to look happy to see me. I wanted to make love before we went out. As always, do not criticize or blame your partner and avoid attributing motives, intentions, attitudes, or behaviors to him or her. When you're done speaking, your partner summarizes and validates your subjective reality. Once you feel heard, switch roles. Step three, identify the deep triggers. What pushed your buttons when the conflict occurred? Often, triggers are enduring vulnerabilities from childhood. Common ones include feeling excluded, manipulated, vulnerable, falsely accused, judged, disrespected, or unsafe. Put in your own words all of the triggers you experienced. I felt like I was being blamed. I felt bossed around and disrespected. I felt unprotected, 
like I had to handle everything by myself. Step four, recount the history of these triggers. Explain where these triggers came from. In your mind, rifle through your autobiography and pause at a page that illustrates the same set of feelings and describe the trigger and its cause, perhaps from your childhood or a previous relationship. Describe what happened and your reaction. You want to share as much as possible so your partner will understand and remember to keep salt away from your old wounds. For example, in my first marriage, I always got blamed for everything. My husband would never take responsibility. So when you accused me of making us late to your sister's party, I thought, oh no, here we go again. As a kid, my mother was always telling me what to do. After my dad died, she had complete control. When you told me to clean up rather than asking, it felt like an order, like I was a little boy again, and it triggered those same resentful feelings. My dad always told me, fight your own battles, even when my much bigger brother was punching me. So when it seemed like you didn't want to hear about my problems with my boss, I felt unsafe again, like I was under attack and all alone with no one to help me. When you are the listener, realize that your partner's responses to the experience may differ from how you would feel in the same circumstance. Do not criticize or suggest a better way. Step five, take responsibility for your contributions and apologize. It won't fly to make excuses for your part in the current conflict or to shuffle blame based on your history. Own up to the role you played. Some common contributions people acknowledge are being overly sensitive, critical or defensive, playing the martyr and not listening. After taking responsibility, apologize to your partner for your specific negative behaviors linked to these contributions. Also, see if you can describe to your partner in a sentence or two the role you played in the regrettable incident. Your partner should do the same. The couple below is working through a previous argument about her spending habits that ended in a shouting match. Her deep trigger was feeling devalued when her husband questioned a recent bill because her tight-fisted parents frequently chided her for wanting things as if it were a character flaw. She, I accused you of not loving me, which I know is ridiculous. I'm sorry I overreacted and started yelling when you were speaking. Her husband's deep trigger was feeling dismissed, a legacy of his first marriage. Whenever he wanted to Whenever he wanted to discuss an area of conflict with his first wife, she would act as if he didn't exist. He, I came on much stronger than I needed to out of fear that you would ignore me. That, that was my fault, I'm sorry. I know it made things a lot worse. Step six, figure out how to make it better next time. Use your new understanding of why the unfortunate incident occurred to discuss one way each of you could make it better should there be a repeat. In the example above, the husband could decide to be gentler when questioning her spending habits, and she could agree not to drown out his concerns by raising her voice. Now that they know each other's vulnerabilities, they will respect them and also help each other detect overreactions. Couples I have worked with who master the technique experience a dramatic rise in their trust metric. When differences spark, they know how to be honest and gentle about their point of view and take a loving step toward each other. Once you get in the habit of holding weekly attunement meetings to process past and present differences, the approach will feel less stifled. Your meetings will likely become briefer and more efficient. In time, the need for such meetings will, will dwindle. Instead, you'll find that you can handle your conflicts with sensitivity as they occur and, th sorry, and thus diffuse them before they do significant damage. Using the State of the Union to handle both current and past grievances bolsters the trust between couples so they can avoid or vanquish betrayal. But here is one exception. This approach alone cannot heal couples reeling from sexual infidelity. 
Although other forms of betrayal can be just as damaging, our culture's misconceptions about the causes of adultery and our general discomfort with issues of sexuality mean that healing from this breach requires special attention and additional specific treatment. The process is difficult, but it can salvage a relationship if partners are motivated to find their way back to each other and to build a new relationship to replace the one that failed them. Okay, so I said that if you only wanted, if you wanted to, to, to sorry, if you were only going to watch one video on this series, it would be this one. And so to give you the very short formulaic method um, for Gottman, give me a second, I'm going to pause and I'll be right back and then tell you. Okay. So if you go to, if, if you get the Marriage Minute or you find the Small Things Often podcast, they have this broken out for you. So don't just take my word for it. But basically the short version of this discussion is when this thing happened, when X happened, I felt Y. I felt a particular way. Not you, but I. When X happened, I felt Y. If applicable, this is due to an enduring vulnerability, X, Y, Z. When you yelled at me, I felt really attacked. This is because when I was little, every time that my parents would yell at me, I, I just felt so terrible and I was never comforted afterwards. So I have this enduring vulnerability about raised voices, right? I can take ownership in that. So you have to take ownership, no matter how small. I can take ownership in that. Let's say you were fighting about the gas tank being empty. I can take ownership in that. I probably should have filled up the gas earlier. I can take ownership in that, you know, we've been nitpicking each other all week and we haven't addressed those issues. I can take ownership in that. I've been really stressed about work and haven't really been dedicating the right time to our relationship. Something, no matter how small, you have to take ownership. What I needed from you was, what I needed from you was instead of yelling at me about the gas tank being empty, just reminding me, and I already feel, I feel bad about it, I felt bad about it. What I needed was a resolution without the yelling. That's the very, very short version of this. And I really do recommend you, you go back, either read the book, right, or go back and watch the videos on working through your messes big and small. There's a build up to it. Um, you know, you may feel like, wow, you know, this is the formula, it'll work. And I can tell you that especially in this day and age where a lot of our communication is digital, um, if I can take a step back, like if, if I'm talking to somebody live in person and I try to use the formula, it, it may not work so well um, because we're people, not robots. But if I have a chance like either through email or text where I can kind of like, okay, this is the method. I need to make sure that I take ownership. I need to express my feelings. I, I need to, um, you know, say what it was that I needed as opposed to telling them what they did wrong, et cetera, et cetera. If I can kind of think about it and write it out before I talk to the person, it tends to work a lot better. Um, so yeah, if you're only going to watch one video, watch this one, tell your friends. Um, it comes best from, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. So check out the Gottman Institute, subscribe to their Marriage Minute. Also do uh, look at their podcast, which is under five minutes each, and it tells you everything that you can find in the books. So look forward to talking with you next time. Um, that's where we're going to talk about recovering from infidelity. Take care, y'all.